This month, we're exploring what happens in the brain when we fall into and out of love. We get to the bottom of the cuddle hormone oxytocin, find out if the contraceptive pill is good for relationships, and we navigate our way round a fruit fly's brain to find out how males switch females onto mating mode. Plus, we'll explore if it's scientifically possible and even ethical to bring on love in humans. This is the Naked Neuroscience Podcast with me, Hannah Critchlow, and brought to you in association with the Wellcome Trust and in partnership with the British Neuroscience Association. Kicking off the programme, romance, lust and love, courtship and marriage are recurrent themes explored throughout human history. The ancient Greeks depicted their pokings into the topic on their pottery. Jane Austen was most certainly preoccupied with the topic and Shakespeare didn't shy away from the dalliances and drama of love either. And increasingly, scientists are starting to probe away at it. I took your questions on the topic of love to Dr Alex Cogan from the Department of Psychology, Cambridge. First up, I asked him for his definition of love. Love is the best stuff in your life and the worst stuff in your life. Love is... A conundrum, a major question that has puzzled humanity for a long, long time. Love come and goes. Love can take many forms. Uh, it's one of the most broadly used words that I can imagine because we'll love everything from our parents to our romantic partners to cheesecake. It's extremely difficult to define, um, but it's something that really vibrates in all of our lives and is probably one of the strongest motivators in our lives. Thank you. And now Graham Bartlett has been in touch via Facebook asking... What happens in the brain when you fall in love? To be honest, we're still trying to figure that out. The neuroscience of love is very much in its infancy. We've had some studies come out that have suggested that when we feel love, the reward and motivation aspects of our brain light up. We do know that the dopamine system is involved within love. So, for example, when we show people pictures of their loved ones, the midbrain lights up, and that's part of the reward system. And dopamine is one of the neurotransmitters that we have in the body related to a whole host of processes, but it's part of the reward circuit. So feeling good about things when, you know, it's something of worth to us. But to be honest, this work is extremely preliminary. We're still really trying to figure it out. And it's no surprise. Love is one of the most complex states that we could be in. And so to figure out what's going on in the brain is extremely difficult. Is it just neurotransmitters? Is it something with your body? Is it something more? These are still very much open questions that are really exciting to figure out. Thank you. So Michael Patella and also Elias have been in touch on Facebook asking, is there any way that you can A, make someone fall in love with you and B, make them stay in love with you using the tricks of neuroscience? The tricks of neuroscience, I'm not so sure. But if you want to make somebody fall in love with you, be nice to them. If you want to make somebody stay in love with you, be nice to them. Um, you don't need to resort to pharmacology and other tricks like that. It's just all that really isn't anywhere near as worked out as these simple age old sentiments of what's a good partner, what makes a, you know, a good relationship. I would focus mostly on that, to be honest. So in terms of the things that you can buy over the internet, so for example, Amazon, I think, sells pheromones and you can also buy oxytocin sprays. Oxytocin is a neuropeptide in the sense that it can work both as a neurotransmitter, so talking between synapses, but also as a hormone, so talking between different parts of the body. They're extremely ancient, so we believe that they've been around for at least 700 million years. We find them in a whole host of animals, and they're involved in many processes related to pair bonding, maternal caregiving, lactation, giving birth, potentially mate guarding. Um, and so there's this idea that it might be one of the things that is really important for falling in love, keeping us monogamous, and related processes. 
we're starting to discover all these negative effects of oxytocin. So, for example, uh, in recent studies, they've shown that when people get oxytocin administered intranasally, they could actually feel more envy and be more gloating than people that don't. We've shown in other studies that when, uh, for certain people who are very anxious about their emotional attachments, oxytocin makes it worse. They start to remember people more negatively. So it really depends on the person. And if you're a person that thinks that you really need the oxytocin to help you out, you might actually be a person that it might have the most negative consequences for. I'd be very, very careful with these pharmacological solutions. It's, it's a young science. We're really starting to only probe really last 10, 20 years, the side effects for humans. And it's, it's a long way to go. And then lastly, Dominic Cabos has been in touch asking, why do I love the smell of my children? Uh, well, smells can be very much reinforced, the learning patterns where you smell your children and you love your children. And we could pretty much pair those two stimuli together. There might be something also in terms of chemicals going on with pheromones and other uh, transmitters, but it's probably an open question at this point how much they're involved and how much of this is just a basic learning process. That was Dr. Alex Kogan from Cambridge University answering some of your questions on love. And if you've got any burning questions about your brain and your nervous system, then just email them to neuroscience at thenakedscientists.com, tweet at Naked Neuroscience, or you can post on our Facebook page and we'll do our best to answer them for you. Now, I wanted to continue to explore the potential of chemicals such as oxytocin to stimulate love, pairing it with the question, are humans meant for monogamy? And can we promote happy long-term relationships using new knowledge from neuroscience? Love potions have been used throughout history in the hope of bringing on and maintaining love. In Swedish folklore, for example, to capture the heartstrings of someone you like, you might pop an apple under your armpit, carry it about for a day, and then bequest it as a prezi to your intended lover. And even since Roman times, various foodstuffs have been prescribed to stimulate lust, love, and good relationships. While such examples may have been based on symbolism and wishful thinking, as Alex mentioned, today the biological underpinnings of love are starting to be elucidated. At the same time, trends in divorce suggest that love might need a helping hand. Should science interfere? I called up an Oxford Don to explore this topic further. My name is Julian Savalescu. I'm the Uehiro Professor of Practical Ethics at the University of Oxford. I think it's important to understand that human beings are, are animals and that the most highly coded biological phenomenon is, is reproduction. That's what enables every animal to survive. So it's not surprising that love has very strong biological determinants and influences. That's not to say it's a purely biological phenomenon, but we shouldn't forget that aspect of our nature that we share in common with other animals and, and, and understand its limitations. Human beings are in part monogamous, they're serially monogamous. People tended to stay in relationships for between seven to ten years where through most of human history one partner would have died. In human beings it's also complicated by the fact that men have a genetic drive to be polygamous outside of their main relationship. So it's far easier for them to pass on their genes to the next generation through a number of women where women have a strong uh, drive to have the investment of a, of a single male. So there are competing biological drives. And say you're in a monogamous relationship, is there any tricks that we can use from neuroscience in order to kind of stay within that happy bubble of a relationship for the long term? All relationships have three phases. The first phase of lust... Uh, the second phase of attraction, fully in love with a particular person for their particular characteristics, and then the much longer phase of attachment where uh, human beings stay together in order to, to rear the young. That's uh, the, the biological function of attachment. And attachment is the phase which tends to fade with time, uh, and it's sustained by uh, neurohormones such as oxytocin or vasopressin. So changes in the level of those neurohormones can affect the degree to which people are attached and stay attached. So oxytocin is released through sexual intercourse. So regular sexual intercourse would be a relationship bonding event. 
as well as just touching or massage or indeed some drugs such as some formulations of the oral contraceptive pill. So in the future it may be possible to strategically affect these neurohormones that are involved and underpin those different phases of human relationships. Can we go back to the contraceptive pill and its effect on attachment? Can you give us some more details on that, please? Some versions of the oral contraceptive pill are associated with some elevations in in oxytocin. Uh, It's not clear whether these have actual real-world effects, but theoretically they could, and and theoretically you could, you know, enhance the oxytocin-releasing effects of of various hormones. And do you think it is ethical or do you think it would be right to deliver any of these oxytocin releasing chemicals in order to help relationships stay together? Do you think that's a question that we're going to have to look into in the future? Human beings have inherent biological limitations and in many ways they weren't designed for the world in which they do live in and the sort of world they want to live in. And science is showing us ways in which we can overcome those those inherent biological obstacles. And, and I believe we should use that knowledge to, to achieve uh, the worthwhile goals that we have. Just changing someone's biology by itself won't bring about any good outcome. You need to couple it with some environmental or social intervention. But to deny people access to these sorts of you know, options is, is really to kind of make them run a, a race with one hand tied behind their back. And what about the fact that um, there's emerging information talking about how oxytocin can have some negative impacts as well, you know, possibly feelings of envy and smugness? Yeah, oxytocin can promote in-group solidarity but but make people more negative towards out-groups. So it has a variety of of effects. So at the moment the science of of understanding our emotions and our behaviour is still in its infancy. But, you know, I think that as we get finer-grained understanding of that, we will be able to to make better and more specific uses of, of that information. So, for example, some psychologists have started to use oxytocin, not as a general love drug or relationship promoter, but in order to help couples open up during counselling sessions and be more willing to, to engage in the counselling process. So I think what you will find is that whatever biological intervention is available will have to be tailored to specific social circumstances and that's going to be a challenge but that's the case for anything you know a blood pressure lowering agent can be good in most people but bad in some circumstances and bad for some people. That was Professor Julian Savulescu from Oxford University exploring modern day potions for love and earlier Alex mentioned another brain chemical Dopamine. We know that dopamine, as well as being involved in reward, is very frequently involved in addiction. So if love brings on a rush of dopamine to particular areas of the brain, is it possible that successful long-term relationships may be down to people simply being addicted to each other? Well, a study by Bianca Acevedo and colleagues in 2012 showed that people who, after 21 years of marriage and still being very, very happily in love, when they were shown pictures of their other halves, had areas of the brain lighting up in a pattern resembling drug addiction. So it really could be that those that stay in love are just addicted to one another. Romantic, in some sense, I suppose. And if you'd like to explore this topic further, visit our What is Love Naked Scientist special, which was broadcast on Valentine's Day, where falling in love and staying in love is examined further at thenakedscientists.com. This is the Naked Neuroscience Podcast with me, Hannah Critchlow. And coming up, we'll be hearing from Dr. Greg Jeffers, finding out about how the brain differs between male and female fruit flies and how a simple circuit switches on copulation but first it's time to take a look at the top stories from this month i'm sitting with david weston phd student at cambridge university he's been off off and away for an explore of neuroscience news So it's been a busy month. Last week I was at a meeting of the Biophysical Society over in Philadelphia and heard a lot about some really great advances in neuroscience. So the first news item I'd like to talk about was for a presentation at this conference by Michael Levine over at Yale University. 
And using some cutting edge optical techniques, Dr. Levine and his colleagues have been able to image the brains of mice in real time using tiny lenses called microprisms. So the group are able to surgically implant these tiny prisms into the brains of living mice, and this causes only very slight damage to the brain itself. They can then shine a laser through this prism and visualise the brain in real time and record from these mice for many months. Wow, so you can actually image the brain of a living conscious mouse. What else have the group managed to do with this technology? Well, one of the most remarkable things they're doing is using prisms to visualise the layers of the cerebral cortex. Using this microprism, the scientists can shine their laser microscope beam so that it runs perpendicular to the surface of the brain. And this gives us an insight into how brain cells in the cortex can interact with one another. So they're really able to look quite deep into the brain and have a look at the circuitry of these nerve cells there. Why is this area so important to study? Well, it's so important to look at this in living mice because we can see how the cells in different layers of the cortex interact with one another during activities like running or sleeping. And this gives us a real picture of what the brain actually looks like on a cellular level while it's actually doing its thing. This technique sounds amazing. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about what they find out when they use it. And what's your second piece of news? So my next news item has something to do with the mystery of itching. Itching? Yeah, itching. So scientists have long been baffled by the physiology of itching, and it's been really hard to pin down whether itching is communicated to the brain by the same nerves that signal pain, or whether they signal through their own individual nerves. So it was thought before that when I feel itchy, that's because the same nerve cells in my body that respond to pain are being activated. Yeah. I can imagine itching is kind of painful, but it does feel like a, a different type of pain. Yeah, it's more the fact that previous research had shown that capsaicin, which is that spicy chemical that you find in chilies, activates a set of neurons that are also activated by itchy chemicals. And this led to the belief that itchy sensations must somehow be linked to painful sensations, perhaps through these same nerves. But new evidence from researchers at John Hopkins University have identified a specific subset of itch-specific neurons. So these newly identified nerve cells signal to the brain the sensation of itch specifically. How did the scientists find that one out? Well, the researchers used sophisticated molecular biology to identify neurons that responded to itchy chemicals like histamine or an anti-malarial drug called chloroquine. They then showed that these neurons could be activated by the spicy capsaicin chemical, but that this sensation, instead of being perceived as pain by mice, was actually perceived as an itching sensation. So these data indicated that there are a subset of neurons that signal itch to the brain, even when both itchy and fiery chemicals are around. So now that these itchy neurons have been identified, what can researchers do with this finding? So excessive itchy sensation can be a pretty unpleasant effect from conditions like dermatitis. And although these neurons might not be responsible for conveying all the aspects of the itchy sensation, if we can design drugs that target them, we may be able to reduce the discomfort felt by patients. Great. So we might be able to scratch away at that itch using this information. And what's your last paper for this month's roundup? My last paper this month ties into the Valentine's Day themes of love and sex with some findings from a collaborative paper from German and American researchers. And this is all about the evolution of sex pheromones, those chemicals released by organisms wanting to attract a mate. Now, while the effectiveness of human pheromones has long been debated by scientists, the value of pheromones in other animals is pretty clear. Males release chemicals that specifically attract females of the appropriate species, and this signal attracts coupling between compatible animals. That's a fascinating system for attraction. And how did this system evolve to produce coupling between specific species? Well, that is the exact question that the authors of this paper, which was published in Nature this month, aimed to work out. They studied the pheromones produced by members of the parasitic wasp genus Nasonia, and what they found was that the Nasonia vitripennis wasp produces a novel pheromone completely different from other pheromones produced by other species. So it's a specific pheromone that's just produced by this particular wasp species. What did the researchers do with this information? Well, they were able to show that the new pheromone was initially ignored by potential mates if it was presented on its own. However, if the new pheromone was mixed with a blend of the old pheromones, the female wasps became responsive to the new signal. And they used wasps from a sister species to show that this effect was very specific to the Nasonia vitropenis wasps. So if the pheromone was ignored by these wasps, how did it eventually become detected? And why is that important in evolutionary terms? 
Well, the data indicate that while a new pheromone is initially ignored by its intended recipient, evolutionary mechanisms eventually kick in and develop a new olfactory receptor for the female wasps. And this gives the new wasps a way of detecting their potential mates in a more specific way, which makes it much more likely that they'll find the mate with the right type of wasp. So it's ever-evolving love. And do you think any similar type of system occurs in humans? So the jury is kind of out about human pheromones, but there is some evidence that they may play a role in the way that we interact with other human beings. Thanks to David Weston, PhD student at Cambridge University. If you want to find out more about any of these stories, the references are all on our website. That's thenakedscientists.com forward slash neuroscience. I wanted to find out more about these pheromones that David mentioned, and so joined Dr Greg Jeffries from the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. He's been looking not at wasps, but at another flying insect, the fruit fly. So you might wonder, why would we study flies? Well, my lab's interested in how the brain works. I think a lot of us are interested in how the brain works. And in particular, we're interested in how individual neurons within the brain talk to each other in order to allow them to process information about the outside world and control behavior. Now, we'd love to study these processes in the human brain, but at least for me, the human brain is too complicated. There are about 100 billion neurons in the human brain, so that's the nerve cells in the brain that are communicating with each other. So even a mouse has 100 million neurons, And that still is too complicated for me, at least. So we study the fly. The fly has 100,000 nerve cells. And for me, this is a countable number. And someday, maybe in the not-too-distant future, we might be able to understand how all of these neurons are connected to each other and what they're talking about when the fly is behaving. Greg and his lab are looking at how nerve cells connect in relation to one specific type of behaviour – courtship. So typically the male fly will approach the female fly by following her around. He'll sing her a love song, essentially serenading her. Then he will try to lick and touch her and eventually try to copulate with her. She'll respond to these courtship attempts by either becoming docile and letting the male do his thing, or if she's not impressed by his attempts, she will just kick the male in the face, literally. What's controlling this behaviour? Well, it's one type of chemical signal a so-called pheromone, called CVA. CVA is given off by the male fly, and when other males smell this pheromone, they increase their aggressiveness, getting on their hind legs and boxing each other. Whereas usually females increase their receptivity when they smell this chemical signal. And Greg is looking at how the nerve cells involved in CVA detection connect and make a circuit to give rise to these different behaviours, as he explains. So what's really nice is that here we have the same molecule that can trigger different behaviours in male and female flies. And so what we'd like to know then is why is this? What we did was we recorded from uh, nerve cells inside male and female flies while we were puffing pheromone onto them. So to do this, we mobilise the fly, we make a very small hole in its very small head. The neurons that we're interested in have been made to glow green so that we can tell them from all the other neurons in the fly brain. We then approach those neurons with a very fine glass electrode and we seal on to a single cell and record its activity. So that's some really neat technologies that you're combining there. And I'm presuming that this is in the fully conscious living fly That's right. So the fly is alive and kicking, and it's responding to these smells that we're puffing onto it. It is pretty amazing when you're doing the experiment. When you look at the activity on these individual electrodes, you're sitting there watching the fly think, right? So Greg measures the electrical activity of nerve cells in the fly as it's being puffed with pheromone. It turns out that the pheromone CVA is detected by the fly's antennae. Here, there's the olfactory organ of the fly, the smell region, and this activates the first nerve cell in the circuit. This nerve cell then talks to a second nerve cell, and the second nerve cell passes that electrical activity onto the third nerve cell that's deeper in the fly brain. And that's the basic circuitry for pheromone perception. It's a really simple three-nerve cell circuit, and the only difference in this circuit between the male and the female fly is at that third deepest nerve cell level, which Greg calls neurons A or B. Greg explains his results. We've been able to show that 
A neurons are connected to the incoming pheromone information in males but not females, and B neurons are connected to that information in females but not males. So really you've got a very simple setup here. You have a clear difference in wiring, in connectivity, that's resulting in a difference in the response of particular neurons in male and female brains. Gosh, that's exciting. So do you know what's controlling this switch, this, this circuitry, for which neurons are going to be connected? We certainly are excited. It's the first time that anybody's been able to demonstrate a sort of bidirectional switch like this in, in any animal, as far as we're aware. Now, in terms of what's controlling it, one of the nice things about the fly system is that we have a really good idea about that. So there's a particular gene called fruitless. It's a transcription factor. That means it controls other genes. This fruitless gene is actually only active in males. So the action of fruitless in males is to rewire the A and B neurons. So what you can imagine is that fruitless unplugs the B neurons and it plugs in the A neurons. Normally in females, the default wiring pattern is that the B neurons will be plugged in and the A neurons will not. So if you take the analogy of a train on rail tracks, imagine the pheromone signal, CVA, is the train and the rail tracks are the cables with which the nerve cells in the circuit communicate. In both sexes, the train on the rail tracks goes past the first station, so the first nerve cell on the antenna. The CVA train goes past the second nerve cell, deeper in the brain, and then at the level of the third nerve cell, something different happens. Here, the train can either go to station A to the right or station B to the left. So in the female flies, the train will turn left and go to one part of the fly's brain, and in male flies, the train will go to the right. And this controls mating behaviour. Greg and his lab have found this out, and also that the simple circuit switch directing the train route is controlled by the gene fruitless. What we've even been able to show is that the action of this gene only needs to be restricted to the A or the B neurons, and the rest of the brain doesn't need the action of this gene in order to flip this switch. So does that mean then that you can express fruitless in female baby flies and then change their behaviour so that they become male-courting aggressive flies? So we haven't done that experiment, but somebody else has, Barry Dixon's lab in Vienna, and that's exactly what they found. So they caused fruitless to be expressed in the male pattern in female flies all the way through development. And the result of that was female flies that would actually try and mate with other females. And what we think we found is this little switch in olfactory processing is one of the changes that is required to turn a female brain into a male brain and produce these kind of behavioural differences. So that was Dr Greg Jeffries from Cambridge discussing how a switch within a simple three-circuit system switches on mating mode in male and female flies. I also asked Greg whether such pheromones and such a switch may exist in humans. He emphasised that the human brain is very, very complex and it's hard to study these kinds of questions in humans at the moment. We don't have a clear answer. But he's not about to start buying pheromones that are being sold over the internet just yet. Now, we finish off with something else that's been keeping a neuroscientist up all night. It's her wonder and amazement at how the brain computes information to give us our perception of the world. Hi, I'm Corey Bartman from the Rockefeller University and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in New York in the USA. And one of the things that amazes me about the brain is that every day your brain encounters a different situation that you've never seen before and maybe has never been seen before by anyone in the world, and yet your brain can make sense of it. There's infinitely many worlds, and your brain takes all of those worlds and turns them into a logical, coherent series of events. We don't know how to teach a computer how to interpret every possible event that could ever arise in the world. You can't even imagine writing a computer program that would program in every situation, every combination of people, every combination of the weather and the place and the car and the situation you find yourself in. And yet your brain solves that problem effortlessly and turns it into a, into a constant and sensible perception of the world. So I'm really interested in understanding how the brain can interpret infinitely many environments and generate infinitely many perceptions and emotions and thoughts and behaviors. And that's why I'm a neuroscientist and I study the brain. 
That was Professor Corey Bergman from Howard Hughes Medical Institute, New York, describing her awe at infinite colliding situations, perception and emotions. That's all for now. We'll be back again next month to navigate our way through the brain. How do we get from A to Z? Are there cells in our brain that act as a compass? And is gravity necessary for this? Could we navigate in space? And how do starlings flock together in such a beautiful murmuration? We'll be finding out. This Naked Neuroscience podcast has been brought to you in association with the Wellcome Trust and in partnership with the British Neuroscience Association. See you next month to open our minds. 